every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. So welcome to the John Schultz podcast. We have Yuri Levine here, a great guest, an exciting guest. I, I know how excited I am because he founded Ways. Uh, and without Waze, I would be a much more stressful person. Without a doubt, it saved a, a lot of years off of my life. Uh, but Yuri has a lot going on. He's recently uh, an author of Fall in Love with the Problem, Not the Solution. I didn't even have to say that because it's on his shirt. I love his shirt. It's terrific. And it's a handbook for entrepreneurs, and it was just released. So this is new and exciting and an unbelievable read. We're going to talk a little bit about that. He's a 2X unicorn entrepreneur. Oh my God, it's, it's hard just to be one. Uh, Co-founded Ways, a community-based driving traffic and navigation app, we all know it, uh, which sold to Google uh, in 2013 for 1.1 billion. And in 2013, that was a lot more money than it was today. So uh, everyone should realize that. 140 million users now, crazy. Also, uh, investor in Move It, uh, a public transportation version of Waze. Uh, Intel acquired that for a billion in 2020. He's involved in 12 startups. I know one of them is uh, Refund It, which we'll talk about. Board member, mentor. I love this. He's an avid cyclist and skier. Uh, so he stays uh, and has adventures as well. So welcome, Yuri. I'm so happy you're, you're on the show. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Good. Terrific. So this is the myth of overnight success, and you are absolutely uh, the epitome of, of what this show's topic's about. So I want to go way back. Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? I mean, as an entrepreneur, it could be an astronaut. I mean, like things that obviously we don't end up being, but what, what was your thoughts when you were young? Um, so I thought I would like to be an engineer, right? Because the engineers build stuff and I really wanted to build stuff. And later on, I realized that the engineer is one way of building stuff. And by the way, I was software engineer at the beginning of my career. Um, yeah, and I've evolved into an entrepreneur. Now, part of it is, uh, you know, people ask me what makes the difference. And, and for a second, I would say, look, um, Entrepreneurship is a journey of failures, and obviously this podcast absolutely know that. But um, if you're afraid to fail, then in reality, you already fail because you're not going to try, right? So so Albert Einstein used to say that if you haven't failed, that because you haven't tried anything new before. And Michael Jordan say multiple things about, you know, failures. I can accept failure, but I cannot accept not trying and so forth. But the important part is that an entrepreneur will go into this journey of entrepreneurship if their passion is so much bigger than the fear of failures and the alternative cost. And so if you're a successful lawyer and making a million dollars a year, the likelihood that you will actually go and build a startup is slim because you have so much to lose. Um, and in my case, you know, the passion for changing the world was so dramatically high and there was nearly no fear of failure that I decided to make the leap of faith. I love that. So you had the nothing to lose attitude. So the, when, when you say that, I think of like Rudy, that movie, Rocky, you know, like all these movies where these people had such passion for something and had nothing to lose. So they just kept going, right? Like failure was just part of their journey. You know, the beauty of nothing to lose is that if it's unsuccessful, you end up exactly at the same place that you are right now, right? And so if you, then this is the beauty of it, right? So nothing to lose is very powerful. In my case, it was more of the passion that I wanted to change the world. And in, you know, in the case of ways, I, I hate traffic jams. I hate waste of time. I hate uh, waste in general. And, uh, um, and so when I tried to figure out and I realized that, wait a minute, there might be an opportunity to actually address that and help people to avoid traffic jams. Um, I, you know, that was an urge 
inside that drove me to say, this is what I'm going to do. It's That's crazy. Before we get to my question uh, on that, I, I want one more question. How would your parents describe you? I mean, because it's sort of interesting, like, I don't know many people that like when they're young, they say they want to be an engineer. So that that that's interesting in itself. And I know it's because you want to build things, but like as a young person to apply that is sort of cool. What would your parents describe you as, you know, and, and how did you uh, bond with them growing up? So um, <clears throat> my mom probably would have described me as a troublemaker because I was troublemaker. Right then. <laughs> and when you look back, you would realize that uh, most of the entrepreneurs were troublemakers because they don't accept anything for granted and they will challenge you know different things based on this is this is how we are doing things and then you would ask why and and what if we will do that differently right and uh, and my dad probably would describe me as some someone that is going to do great things um because i was troublemaker and because i was looking into different things from different perspectives and he would encourage me right so so when i was young if i would come to my parents with a crazy idea and say i'm thinking of doing that then my dad would say why don't you give it a try and uh, have, and there was no judgment if you fail right and so you end up with growing with uh, uh, there is always support. There is no fear of failures because you don't get punished if you if you say, you know what, I'm not going to study for this exam, right? And we, we, let's see what happens, right? And you will come back with maybe an F, right? And there was no judgment, right? And that was the consequences of your decision, right? And uh, and that ended up to be pretty powerful. Um, so less fear of failure came from came from home. So and, what a mentor, uh, what a mentor, young mentor. So would you consider him your biggest mentor or do you have absolutely. any others that came into play during your life? Absolutely. You know, yesterday I met a friend of mine and he told me that uh, um, his daughter is not happy at, at her job and she is thinking of quitting it. And uh, um, and um, she, he told her not to quit her job before she finds something else. And I told him, look, I would actually advise her completely the opposite. Quit your job and then you can focus on, on something, that, on finding something that you do like. And so he immediately called her and said, this is what Uri is saying and hand me the phone, right? And I told her, um, look, your dad is actually absolutely amazing because he is willing to listen to other opinions and actually share those opinions with you. And if I would be you, this is what I would do. But my my tour, my attitude towards risk is different. And uh, well, and it goes back to what you said at the beginning. I mean, that person, not wrong, felt like there was something to lose and not gain. Where you're the opposite. Yeah. You're like, yeah, like go out, spend all your time to figure it out. And listen, not everyone can, right? Depends on your situation. But like halfway so, uh, anything usually doesn't get you there faster, right? So it's it's a process of going there. But but making a change is about making a decision, right? And making the commitment for that change. And if you don't make that commitment, it's not going to happen. I totally agree. Uh, I'm on. I'm in your camp. I I, I think that you got to go all in. And, you know, it also ruins your, your energy, right? You're doing something you don't want to do every day. You're, you're not putting your all in. Most people want to succeed wherever they are. So not doing what you're supposed to do at the high level makes you not feel good anyway. So it, 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 it causes this terrible dynamic. So obviously you're from Israel. We love Israel. And, you know, everyone has to serve in the army. And I guess you served in Unit 8200. Uh, maybe you want to talk about that, but my question really is, uh, how did that change you? And as a country, everyone having to go through that process together, which I feel find it's unique, right? It's very unique. Uh, how does that change you as an individual and how does it change sort of the energy of the country as a whole? So, so you're right. In Israel, uh, military service is mandatory, and it's mandatory because you know Israel is is in a tough neighborhood, and and essentially when you grew up in a tough neighborhood, you grew up tough, 
and that's it, right? So, so the military service is mandatory, which is, you know, the circumstances are not uh, as not that good, but the result are actually turns out to be excellent, right? Because um, if you're in America and at the age of eighteen you go to college, then four years later or three years later you will become an educated teenager. Now, if you're in Israel at the age of 18, you go and do military service, which is meaningful and challenging and teamwork and leadership. And you face challenges that of a matter of life and death. And uh, and you realize that giving up is not an option. Um, then at the age of 21 or 22, you will end up as a way more mature person and educated. So, so do you um, feel it, that it's like boot camp, right? I mean, I, I, it's real, so it can't. It's not a boot camp, but uh, you know, I don't want to limit that. But I guess it gives you different uh, skill sets, right, before you even go to college. And and then you have skill set of teamwork, of leadership, of an attitude of giving up is not an option, and and so the perseverance or the grit. Um, is essentially what is going to make an entrepreneur successful. It's uh, perhaps the most important behavior for entrepreneurs because it's going to be a journey of failures, right? So if you give up, that's it, right? If you don't give up, hopefully you'll figure that out. Were you able to use any of these engineering wants during during your service or was it uh, nothing nothing to do with that? Um. I was in a very creative uh, position uh, during my military service. So obviously in a very creative position, when you expect to be creative, you ended up to be creative. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. So, all right. So obviously that's a cool thing. Uh, something you'll always remember. And and then, okay, so you get out and, you know, you didn't go right into a startup situation for yourself. You went into product development, business development, you were a strategic consultant. What what made you? I mean, because that's not it. What's so interesting? It's the opposite of being an engineer in my mind, right? It's it's dealing with people and 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 selling the the dream and the vision, which you have to be as a, as an entrepreneur. What made you go in that direction first? Evolution. The end of the day, evolution, right? So I started as a software engineer. Yeah, and I've developed product that was a Converse technology, which was a. Um, you know, major Israeli companies in the in the nineties, um, and uh, during this period of time, I realized that I care more about the product definition than about uh, writing the code um, yeah. and interact with the users and understanding why we are building stuff the way that we build it than actually build it. Um, and so I've evolved into um, you know product lead and then business and then marketing and. Uh, and throughout my career, I um, went through from product development into product marketing, marketing, business development, and so forth. So as being in a startup, which has all the different components of every business, do you feel getting out of your comfort zone? You, you said you wanted to find the why for the product, which I, I think that's the only reason why anyone ever buys a product. But for all the younger entrepreneurs listening to this, do you feel like spending time outside your core competency is beneficial? Because like a lot of people say, just be great at what you're great at and stick to it. It's just like you wouldn't hire a, you know, a quarterback to kick field goals, right? So what's your thoughts on that? If you want to be a founder, right? Not, not if you're just going to go work for a company. It's a whole different thing. If you want to do that, you got to find your lane, stick with your lane and add value. So do you feel the different evolutionary tactics you 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 deployed is what's necessary so it's more of a discovery right because um if if you are doing something that you're good at and you like then the state of mind is that i can actually do that for the rest of my life um and uh, um, and this is a recipe of being successful and happy right so if you're doing something that you're good at and you and you like keep on doing that right the thing is that I have the urge of trying new things. So I was actually, okay, let's see. I can always go back into software development, right? Not today, but when I made the first step. And, and that's the attitude of I have nothing to lose, right? I'm going to try new things. If it doesn't work, I can go back. 
And so I made the leap of faith from product from being a software developer into product. And then I realized that, okay, this is really interesting, but I want to make one step further to understand the user. So I ended up with, uh, um, you know, interaction with the user. So my curiosity was the one that drove me to do try different things. Now, when you're building a startup, you don't necessarily have to have all these disciplines. You can build a team with all those disciplines, but then you need to make sure that the expert opinion is the one that counts. Um, you It will help you to become an, an, a CEO if you have multiple disciplines, right? So if you can understand users and product development and marketing and business, then your likelihood of becoming a successful CEO is higher. But uh, but you can replace that by basically saying, you know what, what I do know is how to lead people and how to make hard decisions. You're not going to have someone that is expert on the product and someone that is expert on the technology and someone that is doing business development in an amazing CMO. And that will be work as beautiful as if you would have those skills yourself. Do you feel Probably it's harder better. to actually be a startup founder if you aren't an engineer? I mean, I I, I know there's cases that's of both brilliant. and you hear the back and forth. Do you feel that's an impediment? It's, it's, I don't think so. I think that uh, in, in most of my startups, the, the CEO is not an engineer. Um, and so so being an engineer is maybe an advantage and maybe it's a disadvantage, right? It's the, actually the, the all-around player the um, um that makes good CEOs. But at the end of the day, if, if we think of what does it take to become a successful startup CEO, then I would say probably four major behaviors, right? So the first one is is perseverance, right? So not giving up because it's gonna be hard. Yeah. Um the second one is actually making decision with conviction, right? Making hard decisions with conviction because you will need to make new decision twice a week, if not twice a day. Right? And and if you don't make those decisions, it's going to bite you back. You know, one of my, um, in, in my book, there is a chapter that called um, Firing and Hiring. And when I submitted the, the book proposal to, to different uh, um, uh, publishers, they told me, no, no, it should be hiring and firing. And I said, no, firing is hard decision. Hiring is easy decision. Let's start with making sure that we know how to make hard decisions. And, and it's coming from, from a different perspective. And because I, I spoke with many entrepreneurs that their startup failed. And by the way, you should bring them on this podcast as well, because they they can sh shed the light on different aspects that most of the others can't. Uh, we learn more from failures. Right? And, um, and so I asked them, why did the startup fail? And, and about half say that the team was not right. And I kept on asking, okay, what do you mean the team was not right? And so I heard, uh, you know, we had this guy not good enough and this guy not good. So not good enough was one reason that I heard quite often. Another reason that I heard often was we had a, a communication issues, right? Something that I actually called the uh, ego management issues. And then I asked them the most interesting question. When did you know that the team is not right? And all of them said within the first month. So I said, wait a minute. If you knew within the first month that the team is not right and you did not do anything, the problem was not that the team was not right. The problem was that the CEO did not make hard decisions. Making easy decisions is easy. Making hard decisions is hard. This is why in most of the organizations, they will go all the way to the top to the CEO to make those decisions. Now, here's the real challenge, right? Imagine that you're a small team of maybe 20 or 30 or 10 people. And there is someone that shouldn't be there. And it doesn't matter if that someone is way underperforming or this someone is really someone that no one likes to work with. It doesn't make any difference, right? Everyone knows that that person shouldn't be there. And this is the nature of the beast. Everyone knows and the CEO doesn't do anything. And so making hard decisions, this is, by the way, if you, if you are in a position of hiring people, and you are going to take one thing out of this podcast, take the following, right? Every person that you hire, mark your calendar for 30 days down the road and ask yourself one question. Knowing what I know today, would I hire this person? That's it. Because we do yeah, know. Yeah, it's interesting. Because you never um, know, right? I mean, you, you, you want to know. You, you, like, like, 
as an entrepreneur, you want everything to work, you know, always if it can. So I, I think to reflect and 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 short reflection, right? You don't wait six months. You you we all sort of know how how people can evolve uh in different positions and with people. I think you're right. I think faster than than not. So and, and that's the realization of a startup is going to be a journey of failures, then there are, you know, immediately two conclusion. And number one is that if you're afraid to fail, then in reality, you already failed because you're not going to try. The second one is by far the most important part for entrepreneurs, right? Fail fast. Because essentially, when you fail fast, you actually have enough time in your funding journey, whatever it is, to yeah. try to make another attempt, try another thing and another thing and another thing. And the reality is that even Steph Carey don't make a hundred percent of the shots that he takes, right? So, so this is it. If you watch those YouTube videos, he, like I don't know if you've seen them. He he takes thirty shots and doesn't miss one. I, I I don't know if they're editing those videos, but Steph Curry is like absolutely, absolutely unbelievable, yeah, right? It's like crazy. But you're right. He doesn't make every shot, and Michael Jordan didn't make every shot. They just took more shots, right? Babe Ruth had the most home runs at a certain point. You also had the most strikeouts. So I I, I believe that like. That's the motto of success is like, if you haven't failed enough, you really can't be as successful as you want to be. So ways, right? Obviously, 2013, you, you sold it. You know, it was a while ago. You, you subscribe to this fail fast mindset. I love it because that means you're just not afraid to keep trying and trying and trying. What were some of the months, weeks, days where you thought ways was over? How'd you get through it? You know, it all looks good now, right? But everyone doesn't really understand the gut-wrenching <laughs> journey you probably took. Is there any really cool examples that, you know, that you could talk about or no? Yeah, you know, it's, um, <clears throat> and, and, and this is really important, right? So we started in Israel because um, in general, I would say a startup should uh, start in, in their backyard, right? Wherever it is. Right now I'm in Austin, Texas. And if I would be living here, this is exactly where I would start my startup, right? And if you live in, in Palo Alto, you should start your startup there. And if you live in Israel, you should start your startup there. And uh, um, um, and it then turns out to be actually pretty successful. In 2009, we launched the product in Israel and it turns out to be pretty successful in Israel because we had already um, figured out a way to bypass the challenges of traffic, of traffic information, and we had um, already about a year of running the product as a prototype or beta site and so forth. Um, and it ended up to be pretty successful. And then at the, at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, we decided that uh, we're going to launch the product globally. Right. Um, the way it's magic is that we, the drivers, create all the content that is being used by the application, not just traffic jams and speed traps, which is kind of obvious, the map itself. So the maps are self-generated automatically when you drive. If you make a left turn, then we know that left turn is allowed. And if you, if there are a lot of drivers driving in a certain direction, then we know that is, uh, that this is a road and people can drive and so forth. The, and so with this attitude that we can start anywhere, we launched the product globally, right? And it turns out that it's not good enough. It was not good enough in the US. It was not good enough in Western Europe. It was actually good enough in only four places, right? In, in Czech Republic, in Latvia, in Slovakia, and in Ecuador. And that's about it. And so this is what we are doing, right? So we are realizing that it's not good enough. We speak with the drivers in order to get their feedback, to understand what doesn't work for them. We build the next version that we know that it solves everything that they have told us. And we know that this is it. And it's not. So we're doing it all over again, right? So we speak with the drivers. We try another version. We're building it. We are moving forward with it. We know that this is it. And it's not full year of iterations, iterations after iteration after iteration. Now, during this year in 2010, what happened is two things, right? So number one, we were about to run out of cash. So we raised capital at 2008, and that was sufficient for more than two years. And, and towards the end of 2010, we were close to the point that we will run out of cash, and we still have no traction. We actually had tractions in a few smaller places that no one cares, right? And that puts us in a position, okay, Waze is actually a nice solution for small places. And 
and no one right. cares. Right. And then we go to try to raise capital, and uh, and pretty much everyone told us no. Everyone told us, okay, you have no traction in the U.S. It's not successful in Western Europe. Um, the th the thesis is nice. The problem is worth solving, but uh, it doesn't work. And uh, um, <clears throat> and then um, we ended up trying to raise capital from one of the um, um, uh, from Kosla Ventures, actually, um, out of the Silicon Valley. And we had someone that was really supporting us within the organization. We, had, uh, Noam, the CEO, and myself, were preparing to, um, um, you know, to for the the all partners meeting the next day, and we are having dinner with uh, with the the one that was sponsoring us, and he told us, uh, um, you know, you have nothing to worry about. This is a done deal. And. We woke up in the morning and Google announced that they are building their own maps and starting turn by turn navigation with their own maps. Oh God! And and uh, you know we went to this uh, all partners meeting and the first question that we ask is, is this meeting still relevant? <laughs> and they said no. So uh, so we were about a month away from running out of cash and eventually we figured it out. We eventually we got able to raise capital. In fact, the Google announcement triggered other players to basically say, wait a minute, now we need to figure out what exactly is our strategy with regards to uh, navigation and map making and so forth. And It uh, just goes and back to the thing, and it's funny, like when you're the only one, like, and, and it doesn't <laughs> look like that only one can work, people shy away. All of a sudden there's competition and everyone wants to get in because it makes it look more relevant. Like you almost really want to have a competitive or a competitor in your space when you're when you're in this early stages. So people actually think it's a bigger maybe problem or more people are interested in it. Right. It's sort of like the herd mentality, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, at, at the end of the day, look, most of the startup that I was involved at, um, in their roller coaster journeys with ups and downs, you now occasionally when you go down, your feet will touch the water, right? And occasionally you'll go to inside the water to your knees and to your okay. tummy, and maybe sometimes completely below the water, and and it's depending how long can you stay underneath the water. And um, and at the end of the day, most of the startups that demonstrated perseverance. And their problem they are trying to solve was actually worth solving. They will eventually become successful. It's amazing. Uh, it's just time. It's it's a long road. You got to really want to get on that road. And interesting with you, you know, you've had two huge successes. And like, why do you want to keep getting on that road? I, it's hard. It's like, do you just like enduring pain? Is that like part of your personality? I mean, because it's just like painful. I, I don't know how to describe it any other way. Rewarding. So, so look, I, I fulfill my destiny. And this is my destiny is about value creation. We spoke earlier about my dad that was essentially an entrepreneur. My mom was a teacher. I ended up with having two very strong personalities, an entrepreneur and a teacher. So as an entrepreneur, I really would like to build stuff that will change the world. As a teacher, I would like to guide people to build stuff that will change the world, right? In the book, at the end of the day, they fall in love with the problem, not the solution book, is the essence of both of them. Because this is where I took all of my know-how and practices and built that into the book in order to help entrepreneurs to become more successful. And not just entrepreneurs, right? engineers, business people, anyone in the high-tech industry. If you read this book, it does increase your likelihood of being successful. And for me, this is my destiny. It's about value creation. I love it. You know, it's like you can't help but to scale everything you do, right? You can't just mentor one-on-one. -on -one. You want to scale now, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Writing a book is one way. Listen, part of me with this podcast, I want to scale help too. I like, I want people exactly. like you to get on and show people it's never what you think. It's never how you think it's going to go. But if you keep with it, 
and keep iterating and not being afraid to fail fast, change, whatever you want to call that, you're going to get somewhere with someone because that's what happens, right? And we never really know. And uh, this book, so so how long was this book in the making, right? I mean, obviously you've had a huge career to put lots of content in it, but when was the moment you said, I got, I got to write this book? So, so I would say there are probably two major moments. One is that I did uh, um, uh, an N NBA um, uh, workshop for, for MBA students uh, on building startups. And then I've actually created like 70% of the content. And then I say, based on that, wait a minute, I already have most of the content that I need for a book. And let's figure out when when is going to be the right time. The second trigger was uh, my mom. My mom passed away um, last year. Yeah, Sorry and she was that. thank you. And, and in the last decade, she she spent in an assisting living facility. And she asked me to come and present, uh, you know, the story of ways and uh, my presentations about entrepreneurship and passion for change and so forth to the to to her colleagues, right? To to her friends there. And uh, and I said, yeah, of course. And so we scheduled that. And you know, two weeks before that, she asked me. If I know what I'm doing, because I'm going to speak with people that the average age is above 90. And I say, don't worry, mom. I'm okay with that. I don't worry. I love and that. The, I, I love that. That is so, like everyone still wants yeah. to learn. It doesn't matter how old you are. Exactly. And and then the, 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 the morning before the presentation, I came to visit her and she was really nervous. She was she was not sure that he's going to go down, you know, down the road of the, of the 90, 90 old, uh, 90 years old people. And, um, and she was sitting in the first row, really nervous. Um, and after two minutes, she was looking around and she saw that everyone is smiling and she started to smile as well. Oh, and after that, beautiful. You know, she, she went with me to all the all those people to um you know to uh, to basically show how proud she is. The most important part is that after that she told me, "You should write a book," and that was the moment that I decided that I am going to write this book. I only started the book at the pandemic, right? Because I was traveling like crazy beforehand, and I'm traveling like crazy now as well. But in between, the pandemic actually prevented travel quite a lot. And I found myself um, actually having some spare time. And I started to write the book. So it was about a year of writing the book and another year of iterations. And it was um, published uh, two days ago. Exactly two days ago. Wow. Uh, um, your mom, she knows. Uh, listen, you always got to listen to your mom, everyone out there. Do what your mom <laughs> says. It's always something good comes from it. And uh, there's nothing like a mom. Uh, and congratulations on this book. With uh, and I, I like the book even better now that your mom told you to write it. That's like, that's terrific. So the book's amazing, right? So just to give some people a little tidbit, what do entrepreneurs sometimes forget when they're in the trenches? I know that, you know, you have all this in the book. Let, let's just focus on that because I think, we all get so wrapped up and we do we, we project all our stuff out onto the world every day. What what do you think is the something they they should, you know, what, what do they forget when they're when they're doing it in the trenches? So, so let me say two things, right? So number one, start with the problem. Find a problem, a big problem, something that it's very really worth solving. And then ask yourself, so who has this problem? Now, if you happen to be the only person on the planet with this problem, then I would say, you know what, go to a shrink. It's going to be way cheaper than building a startup. But if a lot of people actually have this problem, then what you should be doing is go and speak with those people and understand their perception of the problem. And only then go and build the solution. Now, if you follow this path and your solution works, it's guaranteed that you're creating value. But if you're starting with a solution, you might be building something that no one cares. The other part that is going to end up very significant is that when you speak with people and they tell you their version of the problem, you are being sent on a mission to solve that problem for them. And this is where you fall in love with the problem. Now, when you fall in love with the problem, it actually serves you in two purposes, right? Number one, the problem is the North Star of your journey. That's it. And when you have a North Star, 
it's way more likely that you will eventually end up at the destination because when you don't, your deviations are going to be way bigger. If you have an O star, then you will have deviations, but they are within the boundary and the overall direction is right. The second part is that the story that you tell is way more compelling when you focus on the problem, right? So if I will be here in 2007, and I will tell you, you know what, I'm going to build an AI-based crowdsource navigation system. Then you'll say, yeah, yeah, very interesting. But you don't really care. Right. But if I will tell you, I'm going to help you to avoid traffic jams, then you do care. And so the story that deals with the problem is way easier to be told to customers, to partners, to investors, to everyone. And this is why, you know, falling in love with the problem is one of the major tips that I can give you. The second one is about this the journey, right? And the um, <clears throat> and we all realize that the journey is, is is I can define that in three different ways, right? So this is going to be a long roller coaster journey of failures. Right? So so it's long, and the longest part of it is when you are trying to create value and you can't. And the value creation is about figuring out product market fit. So product market fit means that you create value to your users, to your customers, to whoever you are trying to create value. If you don't create value, if you don't figure out product market fit, you will die, as simple as that. Now, if you do, you actually likely to become successful and then you can continue the journey to figure out business model and to figure out um, growth and to figure out globalization and so forth. The journey to figure out product market fit is long. But let me start with the following. You never heard of a company that did not figure out product market fit. They simply died. That's it. Now, once you heard of them and they already figure out product market fit, they don't change the product anymore, right? So think of Google or Uber or Waze or whatever, right? And ask yourself, what is the difference between the product that I'm using today and the first time that you have used that? And the answer is that there is no difference. We are searching Google today the same way that we search Google for the first time in our life. We are using Waze today the same way. We are using Uber today the same way. We are watching Netflix today the same way. Maybe Netflix is slightly different because they, they actually right. evolved. Um, but then you ask yourself, how long did it take those companies to figure out product market fit? And it's a matter of years. It was five years for Microsoft. It was three years for Google. It was three and a half years for Waze. It was actually 10 years for Netflix, right? It's a long journey to figure out product. But that's why you said what's so important. It has to be a big enough problem or it's not worth exactly. taking all that time. I mean, that that's the thing. Like, And, you you know, I never realized that. And I'm, I'm thinking of some of the products that I've, I've, you know, I'm in the real estate business and I've done a lot of investing in real estate, prop tech, CRE tech, you know, it's called different things by different people, but the ones that are actually still here never really changed much. You're right. It's just how big was their market? Like, like, was it big enough? So it makes, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. So what do you, what problem interests you now? I mean, here you are, uh, <laughs> you're wearing problems on your, your shirt. I love it. You know, what, what's an interesting problem that you're, you're, you, you want to solve? So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I have about 10 different startups that each one of them is trying to solve a single problem. And maybe for the American audience, um, the most important problem I'm trying to solve is to help people to retire with more money. And this is uh, Pontera, because essentially, you know, if I would ask... Uh, By the way, just interrupt, American if you wore that shirt retire with more money, I think you would get a lot of users very quickly. I mean, because that's what every, everyone's, uh, we're living yeah, longer. We're living longer. Like retirement's going to be different down the road. <clears throat> so um, so let me start with the following, right? So if I would go and ask 100 American on the street, what is your 401k investment at? 90% of them don't know. Because what happened is that in the day that they started the job, they told them, okay, we have 401k uh, contribution and we have employer matching. And this is the forms that you need to fill up. And you basically ticked on the default. 
the default is not necessarily the right thing for you. But the reality is that your financial advisors is unable to advise you on your 401k because they don't have access to that. Yes. And so Pantera actually built a bridge that enables you and enables financial advisors to provide you an advice and manage your 401k to the level that your yield will become higher and you will end up retire richer as simple as that. I love it. You're the best. Uh, always trying to help people like your, your problems are everyone's problems. And like, thank God we have a you on this planet because listen, everyone doesn't like traffic, but they don't go start ways. So thank God for you. Thank God for this book. It's going to help so many people. It's out. It's on Amazon. It's everywhere, right? Do you have a website? People can come order it. What's the website? Uh, yeah. uh, Urielevine.com. Okay, yurilevine.com. That's uh, everyone should go. I want to thank you. Uh, you're inspiring. You're just a good person. And, uh, you know, I'm so happy you were able to share your story. And I know everyone's going to love this. So uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome.